I, my career, where I grew up, and I was trying to think why was that important, and uh, it's starting to come back to me of what was important then. And I talked about growing up in Hamilton, and it, it was a highly active and composed town. Uh, and it was just wonderful. The lanes are now disappearing because they've been amalgamated with modern shops and things like that. But you could spend two hours getting home from school on the walk from school and get see all the things, the way that the town worked and who was doing what. The guy was there shoeing horses and uh, uh, at the same time another one was making saveloys down the back. And you'd go through the grocery shop and he'd give you a round of bacon the offcut or broken biscuits and they were journeys and they were impactive journeys they were all contact things too mm. and so you were known by everybody in the town, good or bad but um, I, uh, I think yeah, I would still prefer to produce housing that serviced more people in a, in a way that getting to this point of home, they could develop us a home much more easily than say um, seize the house as this uh, em emblem of establishment and status. Mm. I'd far prefer to see this integration and the notion of a complexity of buildings and mm. things together mm. than interests me much more I think than just the, the single building seems to sort of be about an interest in everyday life like we said the other day you know that you can't help the dog eating the sofa and you know it's sort of it's as much about <laughs> accommodating those sorts of messy things as, as ironing them out but do you think that the, the roles that you've taken in terms of working with house, house builders or working in government or working in education have been about trying to find ways of expanding that role deliberately or do you really think it is haphazard and just comes from this sort of intuitive... In, in, um, <clears throat> I think there, there are many things that I would love to do that I can't do because I don't have the capabilities to get in there and persuade people to do something. Uh, there are also uh, many times when I've just felt working with people uh, and have let them expand mm. uh, and work with them uh, that have been very challenging but a lot of fun. And we were talking about this the other day in the office with my esteemed younger generation about what they felt about how we worked as an office and, and it was about the fact that they could fumble and make mistakes but if if we're all serious about it, we will all make mistakes. It's just how you deal with them. I think the time I had with RMIT was just, in retrospect, one of the most fascinating periods of my life. Ten years of, of getting a group of people to do something which would not have happened if we hadn't done the first thing. If we'd planned it all out and said these are the upsides and these are the downsides and this is what will happen if nothing would have happened. It was the momentum that was established by doing a couple of crazy things initially mm -hmm. and bringing the students into the whole program yeah. that attracted younger staff and those staff attracted other young staff and that's when we had this brilliant collection of people. Mm -hmm. And that to me, you, you couldn't do that today. Graham, we're um, currently working on an interesting housing typology. It's an apartment, but it's a tiny, 35 square metres. Yep, more slums. However, it's in Canberra, and um, we figured it was going to be a fairly sophisticated type person that was going to live there, professionals. And um, we, we engaged some very young Japanese architects because we thought they could bring a whole new spirit, a whole new view about how you live and work and play in a, in a very small apartment. And in fact, that's exactly what happened. They uh, reinterpreted basically the, the home. It's like living in a piece of sculpture and everything has three functions and um, these little apartments have cross-flow ventilation. They're just beautiful things. And it makes you think, wow, you know, are we a bit stagnant here in Australia 
in, in our concepts of the home and you know the kitchen is open to the dining is open to the living is open to the terrace in the case of apartments do you think and does it interest you to seek new housing new, new ways of living in the home yeah, yeah sure uh, my young partner up there working very heavily on introducing or trying to get forward small compact housing which has no more than one bedroom uh, living spaces modulized putting them together but working at a level which is um, I wouldn't say overly refined but being simple and uh, being capable of, of done at a relatively low cost I do think though that again housing services all sorts of people that's why we have options they mean they relate to location they relate to what one's doing how one's working they also relate to the actual personality of people and there's some people who are very anally retentive and they just love to live in very refined defined and uh, spaces that have to be managed all of the time there are others that, that, that prefer to live in a home uh, where anything can happen and there are others in between who somehow manage to retain a degree of discipline about the way they live uh, and I think that's important that there is that always a t total variation in the way people want to live and how they live it's, it's um, what you say though I think is also important in the sense if you don't try something like that you will never know how it would be taken up or how it might be revered and how it might be seen as a thing that one wants to get hold of and keep forever I mean there are jewels in life not everything is uh, is level and um, nice and pleasant uh, and warm and fuzzy there are jewels that are totally precious and I think they ought to be there and remain as a challenge okay. Peter is it time for a drink? <laughs> okay. Well um, we've got a little bit of time and what I'd like to do is um, Graham there's a lot of your friends and colleagues have come in to see you tonight and have uh, shared your your uh, life's work. And I'm going to ask Chris and Nick to take a couple of microphones, one at the front, one at the back, and see if there's anyone who'd like to ask you a question. Um, so uh, while Nick's at the front, Chris is walking up, if anyone would like to, to throw a question to any of the panellists, particularly Graham, if you just throw your hand up and uh, we'll, we'll see if, if Graham can respond. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, yes. <laughs> Graham, my name's Tom Wilson. Um, you've talked about your houses which seem to me to have been inspired by wealthy clients and yet, yet there's been the threat of grouping them around a social context, etc. Um, can you elaborate on the client and how perhaps they've changed during your career and particularly your work now with Vic Urban and the responsibilities that that organisation has and the opportunities that that client presents to you and others uh, to influence urban form in Melbourne. It's a bit of a, a, a two-header there. I think the first one about the private clients, I don't think that they've uh, in any sense changed from the time when I was first um, started practice. I think that the remarkable difference in all of that period has been the amount of money that people have had to spend on architecture. When we started it was really sticks and bricks and it might as well be been mud brick to get things up. Um, but now there's just a, such a plethora of materials and equipment that go to make houses a, a greatly more sophisticated uh, uh, result. In terms of uh, Vic Urban, yes, um, I've been there for some time now and my role as principal architect is hopefully to um, affect a better result and that result I'm talking about is the one at ground level and above, the interactive 
potential of the, of the street and the open spaces. Uh, I sometimes think we're fighting a losing battle because we don't have full control of what happens uh, at, um, well, particularly down at Docklands, uh, the way in which the developers own generally have a, a right over sites anyway. So ours is a much advisory role and um, we attempt to, along with City of Melbourne and the DPCD, influence the way in which things do get uh, produced. Uh, that happens um, now through a whole series of early briefings and it's still though in the end uh, is going to require a lot of effort to get McGurban and Docklands to reach results which I think ought to match the, uh, the aspirations of that area of the city. Got great potential and what we need is, uh, everybody talks about fine grain, I put that another way, and what we need is to decommercialise the imagery of the building when it hits the ground level to make it more interesting and delightful. That's a challenge. Thanks, Graham. Is there any other questions? Yes? There's another one at the back. Mine is Peter Cole here. Uh, Graham, given the uh, history of uh, the divvying up of uh, Docklands, the whole area of Docklands, which is about the size of the CBD, into, I think, seven or nine parcels, do you have any sort of views about that in retrospect as to how that was done and why did we let it be done? I mean, it seems to me in retrospect that that was an appalling decision to have allowed developers to take huge chunks of very valuable land on the edge of the CBD uh, and do what they like with them, uh, rather than it being incrementally uh, eked out, I guess, in a gradual way. <coughs> do you have any observations in, in, in that uh, matter? Well, yes. I don't know that they're going to help. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the decisions are made. Um, I'm not sure that they were the best decisions. On the other hand, well, I'm pretty sure it wasn't, in retrospect, the best decision. But on the other hand, nothing might have happened down there uh, unless it did happen that way. I think where we're at at the moment is saying, what can we do about it? And can, how can we improve about it? How can we invest uh, our time and thinking and energy into convincing people that it will be better and the long-term cost benefits greater if they do things in a much better way and think about those sorts of things which we find interesting about fine grain, if you like, of narrow-fronted buildings and more interesting facades and how to reinterpret that in the modern buildings that we do at the moment is a very important challenge. But it's something we're all trying to do. And I think we're having, if not an immediate effect, I think we are starting to um, edge into that to the point where it, it is a, the results are going to improve. I really do. We have to move on, though, with it. No, we can't go back and analyse why, what was wrong with it. It, it happened. <laughs> <laughs>